All right. Uh, hello. So uh, in the last video, we talked about the, the basic working of a solar cell, how it generates a current. And we introduced some metrics for you know uh, open circuit voltage and then short circuit current, which are very important parameters in a solar cell. So today, uh, in this video, we will talk about the efficiency of a solar cell. The way we define efficiency of a solar cell is like this. So eta is efficiency. I can basically say that what is the maximum power output of a solar cell divided by power input. Okay. What is the power output that I'm getting at the maximum? We are getting basically the Vm, right? Vm times Im the maximum current and the maximum voltage at the maximum power point, right? We defined that in the last uh, video. So if you are not familiar, just go back and review that. So divided by P in, how much ever that is, right? So uh, maximum power points are not easy to measure. So it is very convenient for us to rewrite this in a slightly different form. So I'll make this as VOC ISC divided by P in times fill factor. So we have already defined fill factor. That is quite uh, easy to analyze for a particular technology. Once we know that, it's typically 0.7 to 0.8. So if you measure the VOC and ISC, then we can easily calculate the efficiency of a solar cell. So this expression is quite convenient to actually use it. Okay. So now the question is, if you want to maximize the efficiency, right? This is my efficiency. Okay. So I, my goal is to maximize eta. How can I do that? Well, looking at the expression, I have two, two approaches available to me. The first approach would be to increase ISC, short circuit current. If I increase ISC, I'll improve my efficiency. The other option available to me would be to increase VOC, open circuit voltage. Okay. If I improve that, then again, my efficiency will improve. So how do I improve ISC? Okay. So ISC is a short circuit current. So essentially it is, uh, let's say you have certain amount of uh, solar radiation that is incident on the solar cell. How many photons are getting converted into electron hole pairs? That is going to dictate my ISC. Right. So to calculate that, we can look at the, the graph for a photon flux, which I've already shown. But this time I have added, uh, I've shaded certain part of the spectrum. So let's say if you have silicon, we said that all the uh, photons that are in the higher energy or the lower, lower, uh, this lambda is going to be 1.1 micrometers. If the lambda is less than 1.1 micrometers, the energy of the photon is higher than EG and they will get absorbed. Okay. So these are uh, photons absorbed, right? Photons which will generate generate electron hole pairs, right? So how much is short circuit current? Well, your short circuit current ISC is going to be proportional to uh, integration of you know all the current, you know all the photons that are available in this spectrum, right? Integrate integrate integrated photon flux uh, below EG. So whatever wavelengths are below EG, you integrate, okay? Then you get the total amount of photons that are uh, absorbed by the silicon. And we can compute this number actually, okay? For silicon, it turns out to be about uh, 44 milliamps per centimeter square, okay? Now, if you want to increase the short circuit current, what do we have to do? Well, I have to integrate more photons. So right now, what's happening is the photons here, right? Photons are not generating EHPs. That means they are not resulting in current in the external circuit. So one way to improve efficiency, you might think, would be to reduce the band gap, okay? So that more and more photons are, you know, above the band gap and then you can absorb them, okay? So one way to solve this problem would be, so reduce EG. If you reduce that, 
you know because let's say i make uh, eg to be about 0.2 or something you know very very small number amount eg i'll make it then my uh, 0.2 if i make it even 6 micron i think will become uh, so all of this wavelengths right if i make eg equal to 0.2 all of this spectrum will be absorbed so you get more short circuit current okay right so what is the trade off okay what happens so well it turns out that this is not quite good the reason for that is we also have to think about what happens to the open circuit voltage and we have already seen open circuit voltage expression voc is going to be kt by q ln of 1 plus il by is right so what happens if you reduce band gap eg reduces implies you know, you, we already seen in the PN junction uh, analysis that IS increases dramatically. Okay. IS increases strongly. When IS increases strongly, VOC reduces. Okay. In an extreme situation, let's say if you choose a low band gap, low band gap material. Okay. So let me see. I'll choose low EG material okay in this case i'll see that i'll get la i'll large isc short circuit current will be large because all the photons are going to result in electron hole pairs but then voc will be less voc is uh, is less also or isc i'll say small voc Okay, if you choose a low band gap material. On the other hand, if I choose a high EG material, what will happen? Well, if I choose high EG, my IS will be less. The reverse saturation current will be less. Because of that, I get a large VOC and small ISC. Okay, so either extrema is not good for us. What we want is to maximize the product of short circuit current and the open circuit voltage. So what I need to do is find optimum EG such that VOC into ISC is maximum. Right? That is where I get the best output power. Right? So what is that? Well. I will not really go into the analysis of it, but I'll just show you the efficiency curves that we get for various materials. Okay, here there are three material, uh, two materials. Well, no, actually, uh, okay. So there is gallium arsenide, which is in blue here. Gallium arsenide, silicon. Okay, so actually these lines represent the the band gaps of various materials. So here, this is gallium arsenide, band gap is 1.42, silicon 1.12, and this is germanium, which is 0.8 EV. So correspondingly, the, the lines are representing. And then there are two curves here. The first one is the efficient, theoretical efficiency as a function of band gap. Okay. So this is efficiency as a function of band gap. EG is x-axis, efficiency is a y-axis. And there are two curves here. One is, uh, what is, you know, Typically, you would just, if you have just pure sunlight without any concentration, you don't use any lenses or anything, you just have pure sunlight. The efficiency turns out to be about a maximum of 33.7. Maximum theoretical efficiency that you can get from a solar cell is 33.7. And this is very famous and it has a separate name. We call it shock dequisor limit after the guys who did the analysis. So it tells you the maximum efficiency of a solar cell, single junction solar cell only. Uh, that you know what is single junction I'll talk about later. So the maximum efficiency turns out to be 33.7, roughly 34%, at a band gap of 3.434 EV for AM 1.5 spectrum. Okay. So this is the maximum efficiency that you can get. And if you have silicon, which is basically not really at the perfect band gap, because silicon band gap is only 1.12 EV, so it is off the peak. If you have silicon it turns out that the maximum theoretical efficiency is only about 
okay and if you use concentrated light you put some optics and big lenses so that you focus your light onto the solar cell then you can improve the efficiency the black curve is with concentrated so light okay this is am concentrated okay sorry concentration factor is 1000 okay so you concentrate the light then you can improve the efficiency but you see that it's not really going to improve that much okay it's going to become from 30 to 38 or so was efficiency okay so this is how the efficiency looks like you know for a theoretically efficiency this is what it's going to be but if you go to the practical field scenarios nowadays the efficiencies are lower it's in the you know 20s range okay so because the commercial efficiency is going to be you know dependent on so many other factors we cannot use a single solar cell we have to put lot of arrays because if you i'll give a homework problem where you will calculate open circuit voltage for a solar cell if you do that you will see that it will be 1 volt or something and a few milliamps of current okay that's not really going to be enough for you to generate you know large power right so we put lots of arrays of the solar cells in the form of an array and then we try to get maximum efficiency maximum power rather and if you do that we have to introduce additional you know, wires and we have to make contacts from the solar cell all of those you know non idealities will come into picture you know, there are various resistances that come into picture also and because of that the efficiency will be reduced so uh, the commercial solar cells it turns out have an efficiency of about uh, 24% that's reasonably high actually okay so this is the picture and right now there is a huge race to improve the efficiency of solar cells because if you are able to extract essentially this is translating to how much power you are extracting from the sun and we would like it to be nearly 100% if you make it nearly 100% we are very very efficiently using the solar energy instead of you know throwing away it as heat or something okay there are various techniques that people are you know researching if you are interested in that you could work on some of this later on but right now this is a basic uh, overview of solar cells okay so uh, yeah efficiency is good and then if i just wanted to you know lastly introduce a couple of types of solar cells and then stop there okay so so far what we talked about is you know we didn't really talk about the material part of it but it turns out that if you use a perfectly crystalline silicon you know, silicon wafer which we use for electronic devices it has high efficiency but it's very very expensive so we have to trade off the economics versus the efficiency okay so if you are able to make a large enough array then maybe you know with a slightly bad solar cell we might get enough power okay so mono crystalline efficient silicon is very efficient and it's used for applications where you don't care about the cost for example on a satellite or you know a space station you would not care about the cost we want to use the maximum efficiency so we will use that there but let's say you want to deploy it in the field you know solar farm maybe we don't want to pay that much of cost so we can use polycrystalline silicon we already talked about what is polycrystalline silicon so when you have this you know domains and all that so that will degrade the electrical efficiency of a solar cell but the cost of solar cell also comes down okay so scientists have been working on and you see that this polycrystalline solar cells are also reasonably efficient nowadays but you know they they are not very good at dissipating heat so there are some trade offs okay and also there are something called as amorphous silicon based solar cells and nowadays there's a lot of research in what is called as thin film solar cells you know use uh, different materials organic materials or different perovskite materials all of this are being researched to improve the efficiency of solar cell so with the background that we have in this course you will be able to understand what they are trying to do if you read any of this current papers you just glance at it and you will see all these graphs that are appearing the maximum power point the current transfer characteristics all of this will appear in the literature okay so uh, before i close i just quickly wanted to show you the data sheets for a couple of solar cells just to say that you know now you have the necessary tools to analyze so this is for a mono crystalline solar cell okay this is a you know sun module this is a brand you can look up this so this is solar cell panel and under standard test conditions they are saying that their maximum power is 295 watts and they have put an array of solar cells and they are getting open circuit voltage of 39.6 and short circuit current of 9.71 okay and their module efficiency is going to be about 18% this is what they claim so if you look at if you let's say you are designing a solar cell for your home okay you want to buy some solar cells and you want to do a more intelligent analysis and design this then you can use some of these things just the parameters that we studied in this small video right just open circuit voltage maximum power point and efficiency we can easily calculate all of this okay 
Similarly, if we choose a polycrystalline solar cell, so this is SW260 poly, which is another module, you will see that, okay, it has a similar, you know, a slightly lower power, this is a peak power, and maximum power point, okay, short circuit current of, you know, 8.9 amps, and then open circuit voltage of 38. So the maximum efficiency is about 15%. You see, the efficiency is lower for a polycrystalline solar cell, okay? But it might be cheaper. So you have to do the analysis and find the trade-off, okay? So you're looking for, let's say, you want a solar cell that will drive your, you know, uh, some application, let's say your monitor, you want to drive it on a solar cell. So monitor is about 100 watts. So yeah, it might work, right? But then we should always remember solar cells are dependent on the solar and the sunlight. If you're, it's a cloudy day, then you might actually get less than the peak. So you might want to have more redundancy. So you have a, build, a larger solar cell so that even on a cloudy day, you might be able to run your uh, monitor or you want to have a solar heater, whatever, you know, we can think of a lot of applications. So this is what uh, is a quick overview of a solar cell. So I hope with this, you will, uh, you got some insight into the working. And in the next uh, video, we will talk about photo detectors based on silicon. All right, until then, thank you so much. Have a great time, bye.